Welcome to Screen Slurps, the movie review podcast where we discuss everything that is good, that is bad, and that is savage in the world of cinema. I'm Adam Meisner, and this week we are here with a special lady, the one and only who's been on the past few weeks of Screen Slurps, and as I just said, the one and only Laura Herlocker. That's right. Fourth time's a charm. <laughs> she is she is the one and only Laura Herlocker. Well, you know, we might have to double check on that one, but what the heck am I saying? I Laura. <laughs> what are you saying, sir? Welcome back to Screen Slurps. She'll be back many a time, so get, get used to it. That's right. <laughs> get used to hearing my voice. <laughs> this week, we are reviewing the rom-com Bollywood film Borelli Key Barfi and I'm very excited to discuss this movie. Me too actually. It is a it's a very interesting film and I'm going to say it straight up it is a wonderful film and I'm very excited to look into this film talk about this film and perhaps even compare this film to some other popular Bollywood films that we have previously discussed perhaps previously reviewed and maybe even some films that we haven't talked about I, I'm, I'm interested in, in comparing how this film compares against other Bollywood films what what is the pattern here for Bollywood films versus some popular uh american films you know there there is a difference there is a very clear difference and uh i'd like to talk about it so i'm just excited because this is the first bollywood film i've gotten to review and i love them it so is this will be good this is the first bollywood film that laura has reviewed on screen slurps it's not the first bollywood film we've reviewed on screen slurps as i mentioned but it is the first film that laura has reviewed on That's screen right. slurps so we'll talk about it we'll talk about some of the films that have been discussed on screen slurps and we will discuss uh, some of the popular things that we see happen in Bollywood films from time to time, the repeating patterns um, that aren't a bad thing. I mean, I think it's a very good thing. And we'll, we'll look into that. But before we dive into that, let's talk about some of the side slurps that Laura and I have been doing the past week. For new listeners out there, side slurps are just some things that Laura and I have been up to, whether that be new television shows, new movies, uh, new arts and crafts, if that's something <laughs> we've been up to. So, Laura, wh what are some things that you've been up to this past week? Yeah, let's start off first. We can start with my book corner, I'm going to call it. So, this last week, the book that I read was Siege. And Siege. 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 Why is that a Have hard you been word for destroying me? some things? <laughs> it's Sieging? A, it's a hard word for me right now. Siege and Storm. By, oh, okay. So it is Siege. Yeah. By uh, Lee Bardugo, which is the second in the like Grishaverse series. Netflix show actually just came out, Shadow and Bone. I think maybe like a month or so now um, on the first book. So I read the first book and now I'm on the second one. Second's much better than the first. I did not like the first, but we're getting there. It's getting better. That's good to know. Maybe yeah. <laughs> maybe I should get, get into that. Have you watched well, the show? I watched the first episode and I was not feeling it, but I think that's because I watched it right after finishing the first book, which I didn't like. But now that I read the second one and I'm more invested in the characters, I think I will like the show. So I'm going to go back and start it again, I think. So maybe you and I could do that together. Yeah, maybe. I mean, there's some Netflix shows or TV shows, I should just say TV shows out there that you watch and I don't quite catch them or I just <laughs> I don't even get into them or you just watch them and I, I just I miss it. But yeah, no, uh, I we have a lot of similar interests, but I think I have some very niche interests that maybe aren't up your alley. So. <laughs> it happens from time to time. Some of the shows I enjoy, I, I watch without you because I don't think you would it would be your thing. Well, there's one show that you're interested in and I'll bring it up when in, when it comes time. But We'll, we'll get there. We'll get to it. Well, that'll be a future slide. I think I know what you're talking about. Future slide slurp. <laughs> anyway, so that's the book that I read this past week. Um, in TV shows, the third season of Glow Up actually just was released on Netflix. So that's what I was watching. I pretty much binged almost the whole thing yesterday. Um, it's just a reality show about makeup artists. So they get these different challenges that they have to do, like creating different 
visuals, right? Using makeup. Great. I love it. I just, it's just so cool to see what people can do. They're just, there's people that are so much more creative than me. And I, I just love watching it. Same thing with Ink Master, right? It's like yeah. seeing what people are able to do with a certain medium is just amazing. So Glow Up, great show. Haven't I think, finished yet. I but. think that that's a very serious talent to be able to do that with makeup. And it is incredibly similar to do that with um, tattooing and Ink Master. Mm -hmm. I mean, makeup and being able to tattoo, I think they're almost one in the same. You're still, you know, painting on a palette of skin, essentially. Right. Um, it's just one. <laughs> one is washable. <laughs> the other one's going to stay on there forever. forever. So. Yeah. And then the other, just the last thing, it's been a very like Bollywood week for me. So I watched another rom-com from 2007 to so like 10 years before Borelli uh, called Namaste London. It's a really cute little rom-com Hindi language film about a woman who kind of similar to this, right? She's going against this, you know, her parents idea of what she should be as an Indian woman. And she is raised in England, so she's very, like, I want to say liberal, right? She's more free-spirited. But her parents want her to marry an Indian man. She goes back to India, marries him. They come back to England, and she's like, surprise, that's not a legal marriage. You know, England doesn't register it as a real marriage, so I'm going to marry this British guy who's like a douche. <laughs> but her Indian husband is like, no, I love you, and I'm going to fight for you. So, you know, it's their whole story. Man. It was really cute. It it was good. I liked it a lot. I think the movie we're going to review today is better, but maybe that's just because it's newer also. But I do highly recommend Namaste London. And that was recommended to me by my colleague Aditi, as was this movie that we're recording. So shout out to Aditi for yeah, giving me all the good Aditi. movie recommendations. <laughs> I'll stop there with my side slurps then. So what have you been slurping, Adam? Well, thank you, Laura. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the things I've been up to this past week, very uh, a strange combination of things I've been up to this past week. But I'm going to start off with I've been discussing the new upcoming Steam Deck, which to explain what a Steam Deck is, it is not out currently. But if you can imagine in, in the world of video games, if you can imagine what a Game Boy or the Game Boy Advance is from Nintendo uh, from back in the day when those were popular, um, or in contemporary times, what a Nintendo DS is, um, what a Steam Deck is, is it's basically very similar to something like that, or even a Nintendo Switch. That, that would look a little more similar to what a Steam Deck is going to be. If you can imagine something that you would hold in your hands like that to play video games what a steam deck is is it's kind of like the same thing except it plays all the video games from the application steam that you own on your user account so if you buy and own video games on steam on your pc or your macintosh computer or even linux if you're someone who uses uh, a linux computer <laughs> um if you buy and own games on steam and you play by yourself or with your friends what the steam deck is is it's the portable version of using steam which to i'm sure a lot of gamers out there is absolutely incredible the thought of being able it's basically like having a laptop only the handheld version um, for video gaming so all the people out there who own gaming laptops to play games on steam play with their friends they are probably at home going nuts for this idea of having a steam deck especially considering the small version of the steam deck is about eight gigs which in gaming terms is nothing to hold video games on. That is absolutely nothing. And it costs a, a couple hundred bucks for the eight gig version. And it's kind of like, okay, well, eight gigs, you know, that's nothing. The next version uh, above that, um, in terms of storage space, is about 256 gigabytes. What? That's a big jump. <laughs> and it's only about, you know, $150 more or so. So, or maybe $250. It's not that big of a jump in terms of price to get that much more storage space. So honestly, um, you know, I'm not being told by the company to say this, but I can honestly say, why don't you just go for the 256 at that point? Like, come on. Like, if you're going to buy a Steam Deck, it's really like, who's buying the 8 gig? Like, which video game do you own? Do you only own one game that only takes up like 4 gigs of space and you're only going to play that for the rest of your life on the Steam Deck? Because that's pretty much the only thing you're going to be able to install on that deck at that point. It's just one game. So you might as Dream well... Dream Daddy. 
Yeah, like you, <laughs> you're just, you're just installing the one game or like Holy Potatoes, a weapon shop or something. You only put that on your Steam Deck, and you're like, that's cool. That's I don't it. have very many Steam. I'm more of like a PlayStation slash Switch person, right? You're like a PC gamer. I'm not. I play Sims. That's like the only computer game, right? Though I think the only games I own on Steam, and this is total judgment on me, right? No one judge me. Are Dream Daddy and Monster Prom, <laughs> <laughs> which are these like dating sims so i got them to play with friends they're fun i mean honestly they're they're a lot of fun so if anyone wants to play those i think stardew valley also but yeah but yeah Anywho's. so that's <laughs> that's really the summary of that and they also offer a 512 gigabyte version i think that's the top tier of the steam deck that you can buy and uh, it's an incredible amount of storage space for a portable gaming yeah, It'll be console. interesting to see the like, screen size and graphics and stuff like that to see how it compares to like the Switch or the PlayStation Portable, right? The PSP. And you can look that up right now, too. You can actually look that up online. You can see how it's going to look. You can pre-order one right now. You can really just, you know, throw the money down and pre-order one. And, you know, if you really want one, if you think like, yes, I am going to use this. I've got a lot of games and, you know, maybe some of you play with your friends, maybe some of you play by yourself and you're like, I really, I really want one. You can look into it and you can get one. So that was one thing. Another thing that I did this past week was Laura and I both went and saw the band Journey live at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago, Illinois. So good. So, um, I mean, we are a Chicago based podcast and uh, it's only natural for us to go and see Journey and listen to uh, Don't Stop Believing live in person. Um, they're doing it as a pre-show for Lollapalooza, so we lucked out and got to see that live in person. We got and- free tickets, yeah, so really lucked out. We didn't even have to pay for them. So that was a very interesting time, and it was a very cool show. Very lucky that I got to check that out. And the third thing that... I've been slurping this past week in terms of television are a couple Netflix reality TV series. And I want to bring up the point that the Netflix produce reality television series, they definitely have a chain of similarities to them. And I'm going to bring up a couple brand new Netflix television reality series that listeners, if you check these out, think about the similarities between these two series. If you watch both of them, the first one I watched was the brand new series Tattoo Redo which I had to check it out because I've been talking about how much I've been watching Ink Master and, you know, Ink Master, so addicting. It's classic. It's been on for a long time and, you know, maybe it's off the air right now, but I think it's Paramount back. Plus is yeah. discussing bringing it back. So yeah, I'm watching the older seasons, but I'm trying to catch up on, you know, what's going to be fresh and new. But in watching Tattoo Redo, I can see already from the first episode It's very similar to a a lot of the other Netflix-produced reality television shows. And it it was a pretty cool show. You know, it is exactly what the title says. People come in with a tattoo that they don't like. It's, you know, it's strange. Maybe it makes them feel uncomfortable. And then they also bring in one of their friends or maybe a significant other or a family member. And that person that they bring in with them gets to choose the cover up that they're going to get for that tattoo. And it's to their surprise. They have no idea about that when they first come in. But the person that they bring in with them is now all of a sudden super excited and they get to choose that cover up. And it, it's pretty funny. The other series I checked out was Sexy Beast, <laughs> which... What an interesting choice for a title for a show, first of all. But Sexy Beast was a person was completely disguised as some form of a creature and ends up going on a series of dates with three other people who are also disguised as some form of a creature. So everyone is hiding their physical appearance and they are only judged by their emotional attributes when they go on that date. Um what a very interesting concept for a dating show. It was definitely an interesting show. We only yes. watched the first episode. So. Laura and I both watched the first episode. And the thing to realize upon watching both of these shows is they're both produced by Netflix. And both of them throughout the entire episode have a narrator who is incredibly prominent in the episode through voiceover. 
So in Tattoo Redo, you actually see the host. Um, she comes on from time to time, like she's hosting the episode. Yes, she's there, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You don't actually see the host in Sexy Beasts, but you hear him. You hear his voice come in. But the same thing in Tattoo Redo. You hear the host's voice always enter with some kind of one-liner over and over and over again. And same thing in Sexy Beasts. You hear the host's voice come in over and over again with some kind of one-liner. It's all about the one-liner jokes in Netflix series. And Netflix reality produced shows or Netflix produced reality shows, it's all about the narrator having some kind of jokey one-liner for everything. What do you think about that, Laura? Do you agree with me? Is that is that the thing? No, I agree. There's definitely a style that Netflix reality shows go with because even we were talking about like Nailed It, right? And Glow Up even to an extent, right? Visually, they all kind of have a same kind of aesthetic going on. And then the use of the narrator. And it seems to be working. Like people love Netflix reality shows, right? They People binge them in a day or two. So it works for them, which is why I think they continue to use it for all their reality shows. Yeah, so it's just something to think about if you go and you watch a netflix produced reality television series you're never going to forget the narrator because they're always going to come back at you (laughs) with a one-liner as you're watching the show and the term may even be one-liner but you're going to hear about a million lines as you're watching these (laughs) shows let me just say that so that's what i've been slurping this past week and i'm going to leave it at that for now because i say it's time that we jump into the film that we just watched And that film is Borelli Key Barfi. And it is a interesting and wonderful film. A lovely, wonderful romp. It's not a romp. I don't know why I said romp. It's not a romp at all. Take the P off the end of that word and you got it right there. It's a rom-com. Rom-com. And it was actually released uh, not too long ago, August 18th of 2017. And just to give a very quick summary of what it is, and I'll get into the details after that summary, but the very quick summary of the film, Borelli Ki Barfi. Bitti Mishra is a bohemian Borelli girl who falls deeply in love with Pritam Vidrohi, an author because she admires his progressive way of thinking. Finding him, though, proves to be as hard as looking for a needle in the haystack. So Bitti seeks the help of the local printing press owner, Chirag Dubey, on her journey of love. Did I pronounce Chirag's last name right there? Du- Sounds Dubé. good to me. Dubey, <laughs> Dubey. He's smoking doobies. Uh, no, just <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Well, didn't. No, they were just smoking cigarettes. I was like, they were smoking in this movie, but I think it was probably just cigarettes. No, I, 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 yeah, I think it was cigarettes. Uh, anyways, horrible jokes aside, Borelli Key Barfi. Yes, this is a rom com about BT falling in love with an author of this book because the book basically narrates who she is as a person. Right. And she wants to know who this author is because clearly that author knows who she is. Right, because she's really struggling, right? She doesn't fit into what is expected of a woman in her town of Borelli. You know, she she goes out, she drinks, she smokes, she has fun, right? And she just feels like no one understands her, which is why she hasn't been able to find someone to marry or really to fall in love with. And she gets to the point where she's like, I'm, I've had it, I'm going to run away. And while she's at the train station ready to run away, she happens to buy this book and while reading it, realizes this character is her. You know, this is exactly who she is. And someone finally understands her. So she sets out on this journey to find him. I thought that was one of the most interesting things about her character as this film was establishing who she was from the beginning. It did such a great job of building her character and not leaving her as this flat, plain character Mm -hmm. in the beginning and not just making her this character that's just kind of like, yep, it's it's Biddy and she's just she's sad or something like that. You knew straight away that she was more of this hardcore female character by making her someone who smoked cigarettes and she wants to be out late at night and she wants to go dancing and i really enjoyed the film for giving her all of these traits and showing the things that she liked to do because i think as a viewer i would not typically expect that from well and you want to know why this film did that so well it's because it's directed by a woman <laughs> like 
I not to get into this whole thing, right? But a lot of times when men write women, they write them very blah. They're very plain. Exactly. Because they're men <laughs> and they don't give them. I, I, I don't even know how to explain it. But, you know, I the one thing I loved about this movie and I think is why I liked it so much is because it was directed by a woman, which is amazing in itself, because I don't know how I don't know how popular it is in in Hindi films to have women directors. But here in the U.S., like we're still working towards having more women directors. Like, I think there's an attempt in the United States, at least to finally, be like, finally start, I mean, start making more movies with women and let women direct more movies. You know, I I would like to see that. I want to see that, and I'm it's still I'm sitting here with open here. arms, like please, yes, let women make more movies. Right. Like. So it's really nice to see that there was a woman directing, you know, this a foreign film, which maybe it's more likely in foreign films, well, foreign to us in the U.S. to have women directors, but here it's still not what it should be. So it was really great to see that. But I think that is why BT is such a good character and so well developed because, you know, we did have a woman. Well, the writer was actually the director's husband. So he adapted it from a book. But, you know, them two then working together, this husband and wife writer and director, they were able to really create a character that has depth and has purpose and is exciting and intricate right like she's just a great character yeah that's good to hear you say that i'm glad that you felt that way and obviously i'm glad that i felt that way too it's very important for a film as an audience member you're expecting to have a connection with the characters that you're watching on screen that's what makes a movie uh memorable as an audience member obviously when you ask people what their favorite movies are and they tell you, you know, a certain film is their favorite movie. Um, it's their favorite because they felt some form of a connection with the characters more than likely. It's mm-hmm. usually not a movie that's just some random characters because, you know, someone said an inappropriate word or, you know, there's some action or something. That's usually not the reason. Usually the reason is because there's characters in that movie that they can relate with or they had some sort of emotional reasoning in that movie. And as a viewer, when they were watching it, they're thinking to themselves like, wow like I see eye to eye with this character Mm -hmm. and I think when I was watching this movie it's it's not like I'm living the exact same life as Biddy is in this movie um, or anything like that but going from scene to scene it's kind of like I I know what it's like to be happy and sad and different things like that and when you see that in a movie like this I think the movie does a great job of normalizing those things to where you can feel like Mm -hmm. the character and uh, I, uh, I I really like yeah. that. No, and also adding on that, too. So she reads this book, right? She falls in love with who she thinks is the author, Vidrohi. Turns out he, that's a, the author of the book is actually Shirag, who's a local printing press owner. He just published the book under his friend's name because I guess he didn't. I don't remember the reasoning why, really. He didn't want maybe his ex-girlfriend to know he was writing about her or I think that was the reason. I I don't really remember the reasoning. But anyway, he published it under his friend's name. And so she, BT, ends up meeting Shirag and asking him, like, please get me in contact with Vidrohi. I feel like I have this connection. Like, I am his Barfi. Um, And I think, so what I'm getting at there is then... He's like, sure, Vidrohi doesn't live here anymore, but I'll send him a letter. If you write me a letter, I'll give it to him. So they're writing letters back and forth. Little does she know she's writing letters to Shirag, who at the same time while she's writing these letters is hanging out with, right? They become really good friends. And one of my problems with U.S. rom-coms is that it moves so quickly from the meat to falling in love. It's like instantly they're just like infatuated with each other. And I think this movie did a really great job through that montage with that beautiful song. It did a really (laughs) great way of it like showing us that they start off as friends and it slowly builds up. And, you know, Shirag realizes like he does love bt this you know she's who he wants it's just like which is kind of a problem right because he's like looking for someone exactly like his ex-girlfriend which i'm kind of like but yeah she is her own person right and he falls in love with her and she you find see her 
not that it's necessarily love in the beginning, but like she found someone she can be herself with and have like a really good friend, which eventually turns to love. Yeah, it's really cool to see that whole montage of them writing notes back to one another and mm-hmm. her not realizing that Shirag is the one writing the notes and to see that Shirag is so infatuated with her personality and what she's putting in these notes. And it's, and she's falling in love with him through these letters. Right. Too. Right. And it's just it, it's kind of as I'm watching this, I'm thinking it's kind of unfortunate that Shirag is just not having the confidence to be like, it's me. I'm I'm well, the author. I don't think it was lack of confidence. I think he wanted to make sure she was Barfy. Right. The character. Because there's that scene where his friend's asking him and he's like, she's 95 percent the same i just need to confirm the mole on her back like which is a little problem like i said right he's trying to find someone that's exactly like his ex or his ideal woman which is uh, but still he does fall in love with bt and who she is so like that montage and that song nazima nazima as you know i've been listening to it over and over the man's a crazy perfectionist for his relationship Yeah, yeah he's an overthinker I mean, I think you mentioned, right, it's a little 500 days of summer. A little bit. I think it's even more so like like Amelie. Like, yeah. Yeah. Same kind of vibe. Benny who Shirag d- realizes she is his barfy. He loves her and she thinks she's in love with Vidrohi and she just wants to meet him. And Shirag finally decides, you know what? Let's have her meet Vidrohi, but let's have him be a complete asshole. So she realizes she doesn't love him. She loves me, Shirag. <laughs> what a crazy concept of trying to plot a relationship to happen for you and someone else. Can you imagine doing something like this in real life? And I'm sure no. plenty of people have done things like this before. It's a bit manipulative. It's- it is very interesting to think that people have done things like this in real life, but I, I'm i sure it's probably happened. But watching it on film and then thinking someone has done something like this in real life, probably, it just makes me wonder, wow, like that's, that's cold. That's <laughs> really mean. Yeah. So that actually, I don't know if we want to talk about it now. That's one of the questions I had for you. Like, how do you feel about Shirag's character? I mean, he is the main love interest, but at the same time, he's not that great. Uh, he has his faults, as does everyone, right? But he is kind of very manipulative and scheming and kind of ruins people's lives to try and get with BT. I wasn't sure how to feel as the movie progressed, even into the end of the film, as we move exactly forward, because... As he was with the Vidrohi character, his friend, he essentially told BT and BT's friend Rami that his friend Vidrohi, that his friend was a divorcee, just so that his friend couldn't hook up with Rami. Well, no, well, that wasn't the reason. That's just the outcome. Well, that sure. But it's just like the things that he's doing it. It is so mean and so, yeah, so awful. I think we can come back to this, but I agree. I'm I'm a little iffy on his. I love this movie, but I am still a little iffy about Shirag. But maybe we should. I mean, going back, so she wants to meet Vidrohi, right? And so Shirag goes and finds Vidrohi, who's moved away because he's embarrassed that his name was on this book. And he's this meek, like quiet little man who's selling saris. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> the way he talks, he's just so mumbly and quiet. And you can tell he's just so nervous about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed his voice, though, because when he was trying to be what Shirag was training him to be, this really cruel jerk of a person, he would talk like... Uh, the super deep, yeah. Like, uh, I don't talk to me like that. Blah, I can't blah, blah, blah. That, and then, <laughs> and when he would speak normally, it was like, "Hello, I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that." And uh, the actor Rao, I, he he got a lot of recognition for this movie, and I think it's just because he did that so well, from going from like meek, quiet to then this like jerky. 
I want to say a bad word, but he is like a douchebag, right? Like the way he was able to go between the two, he deserves all the credit that he got, like all the recognition he got for this movie because he's he was an amazing actor. And the montage. So, right. Shirag meets him and they go through this montage of him teaching him to be a badass so he can turn BT off. Right. Be like, oh, I don't want him. And like the montage when he just parks his motorcycle in the middle of the street, like walks (laughs) away and. (laughs) it's just so good he's so funny it was pretty hysterical and it was hysterical just to see the back and forth between his normal self and his mean jerky persona yeah Yeah. (laughs) very very funny to see that and it even it got better like even so while he's learning it's funny but then when he goes back to Borelli with Shirag to meet BT it even gets better like when she first meets him, she's like, oh, God, this guy's a jerk. Like, oh, I yes. want nothing to do with him. But then she slowly kind of is like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Like when he comes to. As visit, soon as he has to meet the parents, then it just what improves. I was just about to say when he goes to meet the parents and he like snaps the dad's neck. I, th- <laughs> I thought it was so funny. <laughs> yeah, it's just, oh, let me fix that for you. And they're all saying, no, no, please, you don't have to do that. But then he really does fix her dad's neck. Right. And then she's like, oh, wait. Maybe he's not such a bad guy after all. Oh, so funny. And then, yeah, I mean, that's how the next like part of the film is, right? Shirag keeps trying to make Vidrohi look like a horrible person, so BT doesn't love him. It but only despite makes him look all better. that, yeah, BT's like, no, like I like him, right? Like he's misunderstood, like I am. You know, we all kind of, we both kind of go against the grain, and he understands me. So, of course, I want to be with him, which just makes Shirag even matter because he's like the whole purpose of this was to make her hate him. So she'd realize that she loves me. So that's when he does. Right. Like tell them, well, he's a divorcee thinking that would mean BT wouldn't want to marry him. Right. But BT's like, I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) What does it matter? It is so funny. But Shirag thinks that he can ruin the late. Yeah, Shrog thinks that he can manipulate the whole marriage. And Vidrohi, after uh, realizing that Rami doesn't want to marry him, um, he uh, he gets so upset with Shrog. He tells Shrog that he's just going to steal BT from from under him. He says, yeah. you know what, finally, if, if this is what you think you're going to do, then... I'll, I'll just steal BT from you, and that's what you're going to get out of this. Yeah, I'll I do marry think her we need to explain Rami is BT's best friend. Yes. And she had a big crush on Vidrohi. Yes. And we realized through, you know, scenes that Vidrohi actually really does like Rami, too. Yes. So he decides, you know what? Like, I, I like Rami, not BT. I'm going to let Rami know. But because Shirag had already told. BT's mom that uh, Vidrohi was a divorcee when he kind of admits his love to Rami she's like well I can't be with someone that's divorced so that kind of just ruined Vidrohi's whole relationship that he wanted to have and that's why I'm saying Shirag is not I I'm in I don't know how to feel about him because yeah he was trying to be with the woman he loves but that doesn't mean you should ruin other people's life like that whole while scene trying to made do me it. so angry at the entire film and I yeah. was like really you just like you, you just ruined your friend's entire chance of happiness and he explained to you in the whole gist of this entire setup he he already said that he really had a thing for Rami so why did why would you go out of your way to ruin that for right. him why would you do that if he already told you he wanted to be with Rami and you wanted to be with BT so why did you tell them that yeah like you already knew that he wanted to be with Rami why did you tell them that then mm-hmm. so of course out of that he's like well you know what if you're gonna ruin that for me then I'm gonna I'm ruin gonna, this for you yeah I'll take BT I'm gonna ruin your relationship also and she accepts BT and Vidrohi are getting engaged. They accept each other. And her parents accept him, even though he's a divorcee. Yeah. And honestly, as a viewer, I was happy at that point because I was like, you know what? Shrog sucks. So good. 
Take her. Like, uh, <laughs> Take her. You know, if Shrog's going to be a jerk and he's going to screw up Vidrohi's chances with the girl he wanted to be with, like, take her. Yeah. Like, and I think after that, then, when Shirag realizes, like, he's lost her, he starts to understand what he did, right? And because he apologizes to Vidrohi, like, I, I understand. I kind of ruined your chances of being with Rami. And I didn't care about what you thought. I was very selfish and only thought about myself. So when he gets to that point, he maybe kind of redeems himself, right? Because he realizes what he did and apologizes for it. And then he writes one last letter to BT as his Vidrohi persona and gives it to Vidrohi to read to BT during their like engagement party. Kind of his like apology, Right. Yeah. And somehow in a strange turn of events, Pedrohi is saying that something happened to his throat and he can't talk that day very well. He's saying that he doesn't think he can read the letter because his voice is gone and that Chirag is going to have to read that letter. And who knows what happened to Vidrohi's voice that day? Of well, course, as we find out, he was faking it. <laughs> yeah, right. Of course, <laughs> of course. It's like, oh, um, somehow, uh, like, did they say I, his uh, mom made him something? He ate something that his mom made, and it wasn't good. Yeah, something like that. He's, <laughs> his mom made or a some tea or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's something. Yeah, so he can't speak well, and of course, Chirag is gonna have to read his own note that he wrote. So Chirag agrees, and he's gonna read it for. For Vidrohi instead, and as soon as Trog starts reading that letter, of course, everybody's quiet when he's reading it, and all meaning is explained in that at that moment, and all the love goes out, and <laughs> as Trog finishes the letter, and he's tearing up reading it, and he's sad, BT comes up and explains to him uh, very quickly, it's not like she needs to explain very much, but she says, you know, that she knew all along that... Chirag was the one who wrote those letters as soon as she went out for drinks with Vidrohi. Because like the second time she met him. Yeah. So she'd known <laughs> this whole like fake relationship that Chirag was actually the author of the book and she was just like testing him, right? To see if he loved she her. She was testing him. Yeah. <laughs> and so, that's like the big twist of the movie then where I was like, oh man, this is so good. Like now you realize she and Vidrohi were just playing him the whole time. Like, they never actually were in love. They were just playing him. <laughs> I think that makes it ten times better because you think Chirag is this gigantic jerk. I mean, he, he still is because he didn't know they were tricking yeah, him. Yeah, he very so much is still... a jerk. But you think he's this significant jerk of a man. He thinks he's this player who's testing them. And he, he really is thinking, you know, I'm going to put him to these tests. I'm going to figure out if she's this perfect girl when really it's the complete opposite. He thinks he's putting them on tests when really (laughs) BT and Vidrohi know all along that he's scheming all of this. And so they're already aware of all that. And it's like, okay, well, like we already know what he's doing. So we'll just play along, uh, you know, happy ending. Sure. Uh, happy ending. Sure. Yeah, happy ending. And she's like, up hey, you're great. So, <laughs> yeah. I'll and marry Vidro, you. he gets Rami. Yeah. And great. Vidro, he still gets Rami. So, they all end up hooking up in the end. So, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so like I mean we I, I think we've already kind of established it. It's just such a great rom com and so good. And one of the things I want I, one of the other questions I wanted to ask you about Adam is the use of music, right? So in the other Bollywood films you've reviewed, which I've also watched, I watched them with you. I think music and kind of the dance numbers were a there were a lot more of them, whereas this movie didn't have that many dance numbers, right? But the right. use of music was still such an integral part of the film. And I'm wondering, do you think having those dance numbers would have like lessened the film for you? Uh, I don't think it would have lessened the film. It would have made it, perhaps it would have changed the film a little bit. See, yeah, I think it would have made the film a little more cheesy and not yeah. so like heartfelt and... It really depends on, I think, visually how they would have shown the film, how they would have displayed. There are, there's like one or two dance numbers in this movie, right? Right. At least I'm trying to remember. I know there's definitely the one. But I think by not having those big, elaborate dance numbers, it just made the movie seem more real. It really depends on how they use sound and visuals as one, mm-hmm. because having a music video or a dance number, so to speak, it really depends on what they what they show you with the music because 
what they were using the music for in this film would be like the opening credits where they just got done introducing BD's character. Mm -hmm. Then they cut to basically a music video with the credits introducing the film. It's kind of like you learn a little bit about BD, what she likes to do. And, you know, she smokes, she dances and things like that. And it's kind of like you just learn that she likes to go dancing and break dance. And then they give you a music video after that. <laughs> and I thought that was a fantastic way to introduce the film and what it is, mm -hmm. because it's a great way of saying like, yeah, you know, she likes to dance. And so what better way of displaying that than like you say she likes to dance. Now we're going to show you a scene where she's dancing and she's having a great time with her friends. Yeah. So I guess what I was getting at is I like how this movie used the music more so in montage scenes where we kind of get a fast jump in time, right? Creating. So the one time when they use it to show BT and Shirag becoming friends and kind of how that happened. Right. I think the use of music there in a montage form was way better than if they had done a ball, like a dance number. Right. Well, I mean, what reasons do they have in this film to have them just dancing and grooving? Well, what there's reason one. do they have in Doom well, no. to have that? You know what I mean? There's, like, if you compare is, Doom to this one, the way that they There is a dance that. scene where it's Vidrohi and Shirag and BT on a date and it's kind of like they're going back and forth kind of like choosing between it's like is BT going to dance with Shirag or is she going to dance with Vidrohi and it's kind of yeah like, no it definitely still has it but I just think it's way different than how they use it in Doom right Doom and Doom 2 right the musical numbers there like when you just have a, a number all of a sudden with the three of them dancing and they're like don't touch me don't touch me right and yeah. like the Doom 2 one whereas the way they use it in Borelli Keep Barfy it's very different, but I, do, I think if they would have done it like they do in Doom, it would have cheapened the film and right. made it cheesy and not as heartfelt and realistic. Right. And I, I believe I'm agreeing with you, but I'm just trying to say that the times that they use music in this film, I think they have a good purpose for using the music. Yes. Yes. So like the time that they do dance in this movie or showcase a dancing scene is because they're supposed to be dancing for the most part. Or, yeah, I mean, really, no, I, think, I think that is that I is the agree. reason, really. It has like, there purpose. should be dancing yeah. is when they have a dance scene. Or if there's music, it's because there's a montage that they're trying to show different elements that complement the music, or the music complements those different visual elements that they're showing. Mm -hmm. So I think, so I think we're agreeing. Yeah, we're both kind of saying it in the same way. And that relates a lot, too, to, like, the the reviews that this movie has. There was one I was looking at from Times of India. They gave the film a four out of five. And the reason why they say it's so good is because they say, like, this movie kind of breaks the shackles of Bollywood's dependence on, you know, cardboard cuts and these big dance numbers or whatever. And Borelli Kibarfi instead gives you, like, real people real charming people who you can relate to. And that's why the movie was such a success, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I love it so much. I hope I don't relate to Shirag. I don't want to be that much of a jerk. No, you're not. <laughs> I promise you're not. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, these are uh, personalities that people typically have. And I think as a viewer that these are standardizations that happen in real life. And it would be cool if more people wrote letters to one another. It would be cool if that was something that happened in life a little more. But Well, in, I think the way the world has gone and how technology has progressed. It's right. Even for thing. a film from 2017, yeah, it's writing surprising. letters, I'm very <laughs> surprised. But now it's just kind of like write an email or write a text or that something. Is surpri now that you said that, because they, they had Facebook. They brought up exactly. Facebook. Like, it's surprising she... Well, maybe because then he would actually have to have access to Vidrohi's Facebook account to message her back. Right. He'd so that's why find, he was like, oh, he's Vidrohi. not on social media. Right. Just write a letter. Yeah. She'd have to find Vidrohi and know who it is. But the whole thing was that Vidrohi was this like suspicious, not suspicious, but sort of like a hidden enigma. character, really. Yeah. An enigma is a good word. <laughs> But Shirag was saying that he really was kind of the only connection to Vidrohi. So. Right. So he couldn't have had her connect to him with him through Facebook or anything. So that, that is a reasoning. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting concept. And I think compared to other Bollywood films that I can honestly say a lot of the Bollywood films that we've watched for screen slurps have been very dependent on utilizing music and musical numbers as as you and I talked about Laura. Yeah. This one 
I I can say didn't seem to be so heavily dependent on it, but used it in a very good way. Agree. I think I think it's just the genre of film that we the genre of variety that you've watched of Bollywood films while reviewing. So, you know, Doom are obviously like these action films that are supposed to be ridiculous in a sense, right? It's what we it's what Fast and the Furious is to us here. You know, they're over the top ridiculous. So it makes sense they have those crazy Bollywood numbers and all these action and stunts and things like that. And then, I mean, Lagan is like an epic, right? So that's intense. And that's like our Ben-Hur or something, right? Whereas this is the first real rom-com, like Hindi language film that you've watched. And so I'm like, and this film is comparable to Namaste London, the other one I wrote. So I think it's just the tropes and the styles they use in the different genres there, which is exactly how U.S. films are too, right? Or our Hollywood films, you know, obviously a rom-com is going to be very different than an action film or from a right. from a historical epic. So it makes sense that they use different styles and different techniques to get the point across. Right. So I think it was good finally moving into a rom-com and not one of not a typical Bollywood that you've reviewed before. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we should roll into some of the reviews We've seen online for this film for Burley Key Barfi. Rotten Tomatoes currently for Burley Key Barfi. It's actually 73% from the critics and 78% from the audience. Yeah. I think that's a very, very friendly review. I think that's good. Does it say how many out of how many reviews? I forgot to look that up. I did see the percentages, but I forgot to see out of how many people had actually done it. But I think that Rotten Tomatoes, I feel like it's either... If the critics like it, audience doesn't. And if the critics don't like it, the audience does. So it's nice to see this movie has like an equal, (laughs) pretty much equal scoring from both sides. Well, it's a very minimal critic review. It says 11 reviews from critics. So not too many critics on the Rotten Tomatoes review. However, the audience score, it just says 100 plus ratings. Mm -hmm. So more than 100 ratings for the audience score. But yeah, very... Very good sort of ratings right now on Rotten Tomatoes. Some of the other ratings online, IMDb right now, 7.5 from the uh, Hindustan Times, 3 out of 5. Well, I said Times of India gave it 4 out of 5. So it's good. I like pretty good. Pretty good score. On average, we'll say like 75%. Yeah. Yeah. So very standard rate. Um, from pretty much everyone. I mean, uh, it made triple its budget. So commercially, it was a success in that sense. Yes. It also, like I said earlier, too, um, Rao, the guy who plays Vidrohi, he got a lot of recognition for his acting in this film. I think I, I think he won some awards, actually. I think he won Best Supporting Actor at the Filmfare Awards. I'm not sure if Filmfare equates to like Academy Awards here, but it is a, an award show for Hindu, you know, indie, Indian films. He won Best Supporting Actor and then um, it also won Best Director. So the film got a lot of recognition, which is great to hear. I feel like rom-coms t- typically aren't the things that are up for, you know, Academy Awards, at least in in the Academy Award (laughs) world. So let's roll over to the slurps up or slurps down section. Listeners, what this means slurps up is if you like it or if you don't, you give it, well, if you like it, you give it a slurps up. And if you do not like the movie, you would give it a slurps down. Either you're slurping that movie, you're slurping it, or you are not slurping it. Slide that, slide that film away. Slurp down. (laughs) Slide that film away. (laughs) slurping it down well if you're not slurping it then i mean you're just yeah Yeah, what's the opposite of a slurp (laughs) a barf (laughs) slurp down i'm barfing it up yeah (laughs) barfing it down we don't say that in these parts no no we'll keep with slurps up slurps down (laughs) (laughs) well i think it's no surprise i give this film slurps up all the way Four and a half out of five slurps is what I give it. I loved it. I think I can relate a lot to BT. 
I love the way that they set up her and Shirag's relationship. And it wasn't just an instant fall in love, but we see like the continued growth of their friendship. I thought Rao, who plays Vidrohi, his acting was great. He was a great character. And then having that twist at the end where, you you know, we realized BT knew it was Shirag the whole time. It just, it's not a typical rom-com tropey story. And I love that about it. And visually beautiful, the music I loved. As I mentioned earlier, I've been playing the soundtrack over and over while I've been working and cooking. I love that song so much. (laughs) So definitely for me, slurps up all the way. Adam, I hope you feel the same. (laughs) <laughs> surprise um no <laughs> <laughs> no i gotta agree this film was absolutely fantastic as a rom-com i was pleasantly surprised by the ins and outs of this film and the character development for each of the characters especially bt i thought her character was fantastic i thought the plot in this film moved in a great way the music was fantastic And it was just a fun film to watch. I liked the journey that this film took me on from one scene to the next. And there wasn't a time that I wanted to pause the film or, you know, stop watching. And I think that is the goal of every filmmaker is to make a movie where the viewer just wants to stay engaged and keep watching. And I thought that with this movie, it really was a film that had my attention because it was just a fun and enjoyable experience. It had good humor, good jokes, and it even had a story that had uh, a seriousness to getting BT a serious relationship in the end and her struggle to find that. But not to not not one to make you incredibly depressed either. I mean, it was just she wanted a serious relationship, but it kept you engaged along the way with uh, with some humor yeah. and some fun. So I had a great time watching this. I would highly suggest checking it out. I think it's I think it's a good one. So I'm going to give this a slurps up. Definitely. Yeah. And I'm kind of surprised because I usually hate rom coms. I think they're cheesy and the the um, the conflict always really bugs me. But I really, really enjoyed this one. So I think that says something. I think that's the good thing to say about this movie, too, is that I didn't think it was cheesy. Like, it wasn't cheesy. I think that's the big word from this. No cheese. Like, not cheesy. It was cheesy. real and heartfelt and charming. Those are my words for it. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> so without further ado, that brings us to our solo plug time. So uh, where you can find Laura and I outside of the Screen Slurps universe. Laura, is there uh, anywhere we can catch you? Yeah, same as always. You can find me on TikTok. I do some book talk content there. Um, you can find me at Artie Lou, A-R-T-I-E-L-U. You can also find me on Instagram at L-H-E-R-L-O-C-H-E-R. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and SoundCloud at Adam Meisner. I make original music. I also cover music from time to time. And if you message me and let me know what you want to hear, then, hey, I might even make a cover of it or record it for you. Just let me know. You let me know what you want to hear and I will do it. So that wraps it up for this episode of Screen Slurps. Be sure to follow us on social media at Screen Slurps on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And slide on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. It will help us a lot, please. Please do it. And (laughs) if there's any crazy movies that you want to hear about, um, let us know, please. And we'll, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll look into it. We'll look at it. And leave a comment on one of our social media pages. And trust me when I say we will talk about it. I can't say it enough. If you want us to talk about a movie, we will talk about it. So, closing out, I'm Adam Meisner. And I'm Laura Herlocker. Slurps up, and we will catch you later. Later.